1 minus x squared. Uh, or I've lost 2. Yeah, 1 half the step to the minus 1 half. So that's the arc sign. So it's good. Why are people looking so blank? You're okay with this? You're the one that asked, so if you're happy, we'll go. I'm happy, but I'll like this. Okay, so I'm claiming that the derivative of this is this. And so I get an arc sign from the product rule, but then I also get x times the derivative of arc sign. And then the derivative of this is the minus x. Okay, where did you go? Right? Because I get a 2, well, okay, there's a 2 here and a 2 there. You don't see that or you do see that? And, and so this is 0. So this stuff is gone. So then we're happy. Do you have a question or are you? Okay, your turn. Um, can you do the intervals for the Yeah, didn't I just do that one on the other? I don't know. In that you have to make a substitution, and then you have to be clever, and then you have to do some stuff, and mm, I mean, yeah, but okay. So first, there's not a whole lot you can do straight off. It should be obvious that, I mean, you can't do parts really because, you, I mean, I guess you can take the derivative of this and pick up an x. It's not going to be good. So I will try. U equals the log. So du is uh, 1 over x dx. And now you might say, but now what? I don't have a 1 over x dx. But then you'd be clever. So x du is a dx. And if u is the log, then x is e to the u. So I can rewrite this as e to the u du is dx. And so that transforms this into something that we can do. Because now this becomes, so sine of log of x becomes the integral of the sine of u, and dx becomes e to the u du. So this is one that Maybe looks a little familiar. Um, somebody asked me if we need to memorize the identity that is this. This is one where you integrate by parts twice and you get the same thing back, which I can do if you want or not if you don't. So here we integrate by parts twice and get back to what we had plus some junk, and it's one half the sine minus the cosine or the cosine minus the sine or something like that. If you want me to do? If anyone wants me to do that, I will do it. You want me to do that? Okay. So now we do parts two times. So, and unfortunately, I'm going to call this instead of you. I'm going to call it A because uh, I want to use you for parts. So the substitution I made was with A. So I'm going to do parts now. And I can choose either part to be u and the other part to be dv. So I'm going to choose u to be the sine and dv to be e to the a dA. And so that means v is e to the a and du is minus the cosine. And so now this becomes uh, something. It becomes UV, so e to the a sine a minus the integral of v du 
So since it's a minus a minus, it becomes a plus. E to the A, cosine A, dA. And then I do parts again. Yeah? OK, so this is minus. And it's UV minus V. Because it's on what's name? It's still minus. OK, thank you. It's minus next time. So if I make the same mistake twice, they'll cancel out the okay. Um All right, so it really is minus. I don't know why. OK, so here, to do this time, we do the same trick. We take U to be the cosine and dV to be e to the a dA. And so du is now the minus guy. And v is e to the a. And so this equals, well, I have that e to the a sine a from before. And then this time, I pick up another e to the a cosine a. Uh, but it's negative because I'm subtracting the real right this way. And then I have an integral left over, which is minus the integral. Uh-oh. Oh, yeah. It's minus a minus, so it becomes a plus of e to the a sine a dA. And so I have this thing equals this stuff plus the same thing. So I can solve for the thing. So that tells me that 2 times the integral of e to the a sine a dA equals e to the a sine a minus e to the a cosine a. So that means e to the a sine a is one half of this. The integral of e to the a sine a is one half. Let's put the e to the a outside. e to the a sine a minus cosine a plus a constant. And a is the log. So this is. Well, e to the log is just x. Sine log of x minus cosine log of x plus a constant. Okay? So, yeah. Would a problem with this be a part two? This would for sure be a part two problem. Um, part one problem. We haven't had any part one problems yet. So, I mean, an integration by parts problem could be a part, part, part one problem, but we have to be just as straightforward. Here's one part, here's the other part. Go. So, the, the arc sine one was an easy part two problem. It's borderline hard for part one. So any questions on this? So, you know, I don't want to do all 86 problems on web assign, but, yeah. Um, can you talk about the sequence or a series? A sequence or a series? Do you have one in mind? Well, I like natural log, not like rats, right? <laughs> So 
So this should be, oh, right, Mopital's rule. But maybe not. Is it not all right, Mopital's rule to you? Okay, well, all right, Mopital's rule. So we plug in. This is over form, infinity over infinity, so we can use Mopital's rule, which says we take the derivative of the top and the derivative of the bottom. And the limit will be the same. And I'm getting the derivative with respect to n. So the derivative of n is 1. The derivative of the log of 2n is 1 over 2n times the derivative of 2n, which is 2. So this is the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n, which is 0. So the sequence converges and it converges to zero. Two 
factorial of x minus a squared. Okay? So the next term here is just going to be the derivative times x minus a. So this will be 1 12 x minus 2. 8, 8, 8. And then the second derivative is the derivative of this, which is minus 2 ninths x to the minus 5 thirds. When I plug in 8, I get minus 2 ninths. And then I have to raise 2 to the fifth power, which is 32. So 1 over 32, which is some number. 1 over 32. I don't know what 9 times 16 is. Uh, it's 9 times 8, which is 72, 144. So I get 144, but I have to divide by 2, so it's actually 288. Um, x minus a to the quantity squared. Okay? So. And it's negative. So there's the answer to the first part. If I had asked for t3, you take the derivative again, plug in, and then you would have whatever number you get here, divide it by 6, multiply it by x minus a cubed, and you just keep going until time's done. So now the second part says, how good is this for x between, uh, that's a 9, between 7 and 9? So Taylor inequality says, we look at some error, less than or equal to m, I'll say what, so m is the maximum of the next derivative, over 3 factorial in this case, times x minus 8, so to the 3. So m here is really the max of the fourth derivative, of the third derivative of, well, let's just call it x. <coughs> Where the maximum is over the, the range in question. So we have to look at the third derivative. Uh, I guess I'll go erase this guy now. So we look at the third derivative, and we want to know when it's the biggest. So the third derivative is, uh,
Anybody confused about this? You're confused. No, it can't be negative. Yeah, but it's the absolute value. Because you don't have a negative error. Right? The amount you're off is not a negative number. I mean, on one side you'll be negative, and on the other side you'll be positive. So this is over the whole range. So your mistake is the absolute value. Yeah. Well, this is really one unit away from eight. So it's minus one and plus one. So I'm really thinking of this as eight minus one and eight plus one. And so I'm saying, so if this were, if this were, well, I don't know. If this were a 12, then I would have to use 4. I mean, I would have to use not 12, but I would have to use, where did I get 12? Uh, I would have to use 4 here instead of 7, because it's not centered. I don't expect you to know, I, I mean, I might ask you to derive, or, so I don't want you to memorize any reduction formulas. If you happen to know them, good for you. So if I happen to ask one that is one that you know, okay. It would not be out of bounds to ask you to do something where you have to integrate by parts 27 times, and so therefore you would want to derive your own reduction formula and then just use it. But I don't want you to memorize reduction formulas, because this is only the off chance that I might ask you to, I don't know, do the integral of x to the 12th e to the x. Well, probably I won't be asking you to do the integral of x to the 12th e to the x. But if I did, you could just figure out what using integration by parts x to the n e to the x gives you, and then plug in n equals 12. Does that, do you understand the question? Yeah. The answer? I so much? Yeah. So, if I, so, okay, so here's the question that I'm not going to ask because I'm telling you how to do it right now. Suppose the question were, find the integral of x to the 12, e to the x, dx, say, or 215, I don't care. How would you do this? Well, you could integrate by parts 12 times, but the pattern is pretty obvious. Once you do it once or twice, you see what's going on. So if you integrate, so you integrate by parts once, you get an x to the 11th, you do it again, you get an x to the 10th, blah, blah, blah. So you might as well figure out what the formula is once and for all and then plug in. This would for sure be a part two question, and it would be a hard part two question. And I might even say, Hint, figure out x to the n, e to the x first. In other words, derive the reduction formula. So, okay, let's figure out x to the n, e to the x first. So x to the n, e to the x is, well, we take u equal x to the n, so du is n x to the n minus 1, and dv is e to the x, so d is e to the x. And so this becomes x to the n e to the x minus the integral of n x to the n minus 1 oops the integral of n x to the n minus 1 e to the x dx so now we have our formula in our hands and we just use it for n equals 12 so I mean, this is going to get long so let me just start using it. And then I will 
and get tired and stop, which I get to do. You don't. Um, so that says that x to the 12th e to the x dx is x to the 12th e to the x minus integral of 12 x to the 11th e to the x. Well, what is it when we use n equals 11? We get x to the 11th e to the x minus 11 x to the 10th e to the x. So, and then, then there's a minus, oops, sorry, there's an integral here. I lost place. Yes, so minus the integral of, yes, 11x to the 10th e to the x. But what's the integral of 11x to the 10th e to the x? It is, so this part expands to be 10x to the 9th e to the x. Uh, did I do something? Oh, that's right. Yeah. And you just keep going. So let me stop because I'm tired. Um, you just keep going and you'll get you get x to the 12th e to the x minus 12x to the 11th e to the x plus uh, 12 times 11 x to the 10th e to the x minus 12 times 11 times 10 x to the 9th e to the x plus da 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 da. So you just pick up another factor and the power goes down by one and the signs alternate. And so it's long because it's 12. But so, but I do not, I certainly do not recommend that you memorize this formula. Because this formula is only useful in the context of this problem. But you should know how to derive such formulas, which just pretend then is enough. Are we done? You divide by 3, well, we almost have it looking like that. Except I really want to think of this 3 as the square root of 3 squared. Now I make the substitution u equals x squared root 3. becomes the arc tan of u, and I pick up the square root of 3. And u was the square root of 3. Okay, so this is a part one question. Somebody in the back, wow. All right. Can you do one where you have to um, solve for a constant to make 
the soft period. Ah, okay. I have an example. You have one of mine? Yeah. Okay. terms do I have there? Well, it is big. Did I do something wrong? This 
this looks, I mean, did I do this? Does anyone see some algebra error? Because it seems like it works for any kid. No? Okay, so let's, let me just check with k equals 1. So if k equals 1, I get n plus 1, that's 1, and that's 1. But if k equals 2, if k equals 2, then this is an n plus 1, and this is 2n plus 2 times 2n plus 1, and we're done. And the limit of that is for sure 0. This works for any k bigger than 1. Is there a specific k, or does it say for what k? So it doesn't work when k is 1, but any k bigger than 1 converges. Okay, I thought there was a specific value of k you were looking for. So is this, did I lose you in this? Thing? Okay, so let me explain again what I did. Write the k. Here we go. Now expand all of this garbage and cancel everything you can. So here, well, n plus 1 factorial over n factorial is n plus 1. There's a square here and a square here, so I'm left with an n plus 1 squared on the top. Let me do this one again a little more slowly. Is it clear why this is kn plus k? Okay. So kn plus k factorial is kn plus k times kn plus k minus 1. Is kn plus k minus 2. Da -da 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 -da. And eventually we'll get to kn plus k minus k. So there'll be k terms as it goes from here to here. Okay, so we get on the bottom. kn plus k, and then the next one is kn plus k minus k1. And we keep going until we get down to kn uh, plus 1. And then the next one is kn here, but this is a factorial, and I had a kn factorial here, so that cancels. Okay. And I want to know what's the limit of this as n goes to infinity. Well, this one I can factor a k out. So this is really k times n plus 1. So I can cancel, I already canceled one of these squares. I cancel one of these squares with that. Now the question is, for what case will this limit, when n gets big, be less than 1? Because I'm doing a ratio test. So I want to know, for what case will this be less than 1? Well, here, I have an n plus 1 on the top, and I need something smaller than n plus 1 on the bottom to know that it goes to infinity. But look at the degree of this. As long as I have at least two terms here, I have, so this is bigger than an n plus 1 on the top. On the bottom, I have a k. And then here, I have something like n plus 1, and I have lots of things with n's. So this will be n to the k minus 1. So now n is going to infinity. Well, as long as the degree here is bigger than the degree here, it goes to 0. So this goes to 0 if k is bigger than 1. Uh, I think this is just a k. Maybe it's k is bigger than 2. So. How many do I have? It's got to be 1. Yeah, it's just a k. Okay? This is definitely a part two question. This is, this is a hard question. So, so let me just emphasize again the structure of the exam. Part one consists of very straightforward questions 
that anybody who deserves to pass the class should be able to do basically all of them. Making it be 80% so that you can make a mistake or two. But basically, part two, part one is essentially equivalent to the placement exam that would allow you to place out of this class. To place out of this class, you have to get 80% on the placement exam. So, if you get 80% on part one, then I will pass you. Part two is harder stuff. Part two is like the midterms. So, some of the part two questions will be easy, and some of the part two questions will be hard. This will be a hard part two question. So, hard questions I don't expect anybody to get. I don't, I don't expect everybody who passes to get. I expect only the A students to get. Yeah? The parts are graded separately, and then I put them together. So part one just says, see or better, yes, no. And then part two says, then, so really it's part one, and then your grade on the final is part one plus two. But if you're, that's, so that's how it is. There's a bar you must clear, and then there's how high you to jump over the bar. Okay, other questions? I haven't brought this much chalk, so we need to be done. Yeah? Um, I don't have any examples, so I don't think you might try. So, a logistic equation type question, you would have something like um, a logistic differential equation like. Uh, y is some number like 0.03 uh, x times 1 minus x over 100. Say there's a differential equation. Kind of question that could be asked on this, and then maybe I give you some initial as well. So one thing I would say is solve. Uh, except I'm writing x's when they should be y's. So. Uh, so, several different types of questions could be asked about this. One, just give me a formula. So that means you separate variables and you integrate, or maybe you memorize the formula, or whatever. Another type of question I could ask is, uh, Maybe instead of giving you the 0.03 and the 100, I give you constants A and B, and I give you some data, and I ask you to find the constants A and B. Or I give you an initial condition, Y of 0 is 10, what happens? Y of 0 is 110, what happens? Those kinds of questions. Do you want me to do any of those, or do you know how to do all Do that all. So I didn't give you the 0.03. Well, uh, I guess this is usually called K. And I didn't give you this. Okay. So then I could give you. I mean, these are all. Okay. So I could give you, for example, that y of 0 is 10. And y, maybe I'll give you y prime of 0 instead. y prime of 0 is a, give me a formula, or tell me the population after 10. So, so there's a kind of a question with unknown constants and blah, blah, blah. This is one where you would find the formula rather than analyze the phase and analyze the picture. So, what do you mean? What, what do you mean? What do you need to do? You need a formula. So, let's solve this separable differential equation. So, we can solve this differential equation. Maybe you memorized the formula already. 
If you memorize the formula, you don't need to solve it. Yeah? Um, on the test, um, let's say, like, the test asks us to solve the, the, the equation. Um, and then, let's uh, say, I memorize it. So that means I'm not to show where I can just write the answer. Like, so I'm not going to ask a question that tells you how to do the problem. I would say, this is the question. So if you want to skip the next step that I'm going to do and write it down, that's fine. I don't care. But suppose I change this and put a square here. Now you're screwed. You didn't memorize that formula. So. Depends on how the problem is bridge. So if this is the problem and you memorize the formula, then you can say, this is a logistic equation. I know the solution to the logistic equation looks like this. But right, I know the solution to the logistic equation is this. Don't say, my friend has this formula on his page, so I wrote it down. Okay? So just in case you didn't memorize the formula, or just in case I changed this from a y to a y squared, or something like that, let's solve the equation. Even though you've done it a hundred times already. So, you lie over, let's leave the k over there, by over y times 1 minus y over m equals k dt. Separable, so I separated variables. Um, you know, actually, let's find k first. k is obviously a half. Is that clear? No, it isn't. Let's see. I guess it's not obvious. It, it is a half, but okay. It's obvious to me. So I'll do this side. Well, this is a partial fraction. All right, to do this, we have to do partial fraction. Um, I'm going to rewrite this just to make my life a little easier. Uh, so, okay. so I need to do the integral of this and the integral of this. So I need to know how to do this integral, and this is partial fraction. So I need to know for what values of a and b So I have this, and in fact, I'm going to write this that way, just that I don't have fractions over fractions. Is that okay? Okay, so now I need to find A and B so that that's true. Um, so that means... Uh, A times M minus Y plus B times M plus 1 by cross multiplying. And so if Y equals M, then B is 1 over X. Oh, yeah, thank you. Did I get that right? This is right, isn't it? Multiply by m top and bottom. Okay, so if y equals, how about y equals 0 first? If y equals 0, then we see that am equals 1. So a is 1 over m. And if y equals m, then we have bm squared is 1, so b is 1 over m squared. Something's wrong here. What did I do wrong? One of the signs should be negative. This is 1 over m. That's true. 1 over y plus 
plus n over m minus y is n minus y plus y. Oh, it's right. Okay. So then this, so then this becomes, this is going to be here. So this becomes the integral of So I have y over y minus m is e to the mk a e to the mkt. And now I'm going to solve for y. And you have to do some dancing around to solve for y, right? You cross multiply and burger, burger, burger. And you should get something that I already forgot. Y equals, I don't know. I think this is right, isn't it? Okay, so, so now we know Y of zero is a half. No, I already erased what I have. Y prime of zero is a half, and Y of zero is 10. So y of 0 is 10 tells me that a is 10. Right? Because I have 0, so that a is 10. And y prime of 0 is a half. Well, I guess I got to solve for y first. We have chased them all away. Um, so solve it for y. You really want to do this? Yeah? yeah. It's just <laughs> so, you memorized the formula. Tell me the formula. I didn't memorize it. Did anyone? That sounds right. Yeah. Okay. Use the fact 
here, that y of 0 is 10. So I look here, when y is 0, I have 0. Uh, I have, I'm sorry, when t is 0, I have a equals 10 over 10 minus n. Yeah, well, that's where I screwed up. So I needed to give you another piece of information. You need three pieces of information to give you a problem, and I only give you two. I would, I would, well, or I would give you y of one. I would give you the ability to find it, which I didn't do. Or I would give you k, or I would give you some stuff. So let me point out that both exponential growth and logistic growth and all of these things are just special examples of separable differential equations. The main goal of this class is not to teach you the two models, two biological population models that we have, but to teach you to deal with separable differential equations when they arise. So I am not wedded to the logistic particularly or to the exponential particularly. What's important is the technique of being able to solve them and being able to find the constants. This is a hint. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. We seem to have all the questions today. It's okay. So you cross multiply. You expand it out. And you bring the A, E to the K and over here. You factor that out and I'll move divide. And I got tired, so I stopped. I mean, it's really just the algebra. But this seems to be most calculus students' biggest problems are actually pre-calculus and algebra. Calculus is easy. It's algebra. Yeah. Um, can you do a uh, cross section for area one? Sure. Do you have one in mind? Yeah. It's A, B, or A, or 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 B, or A, or
This is a smaller square. This is a smaller square. This is a smaller square. That's a point square. So this thing comes up like this. If I try and draw it from the side, that's looking at this line. Well, maybe I'll draw it the other way. Um, if I look from here, that's my eye. Um, this is my eye, looking from there. Then we see a thing. The base is a, is a circle, and there's a big square cross section at the back. And then this sort of shrinks down to a point like that. And the cross sections are squares. I don't know if you can visualize it, it doesn't really matter too much. These squares come up out of the board this way. So to find its bottom, you imagine that I'm just going to take out a saw, and I'm going to cut this up into a bunch of little slices of, like, cheese slices. And then I just want to add up all of their bottoms. So the volume of the whole thing is the integral of the volume of the slice, or the area of the slice, the, well, which way am I cutting it? I'm cutting it up this way, so my slices are dy. And I need to know what is y range from when I'm doing this slicing. Well, here, the biggest slice, y is 0. Here, the tiniest slice, y is 2. So this goes from 0 to 2 of the area of the slice. Now, if I take a particular slice, how about this one, at some given height y, and I look at it, it's a square. So this slice here, looks like that. And it's got a little thickness of dy. And it's a square. What is the distance from here to here? Well, this is, if I tell you why, I know that x squared plus y squared is 4. And so I want to figure out, if I tell you what the y value is, what the x value is. I may be wrong. I said, <coughs> yeah, so x is a function of y, so x squared is 4 minus y squared. That means that x is the plus or minus the square root. So here is the plus square root. And here is the minus square root. So what's the distance from here to here? Two times the square root. So this is two, two times the square root plus four minus y squared. And so is this. It's a square. So it's a square map. So that means that I integrate as y goes from 0 to 2, of 2 times the square, 2 times the square root of 4 minus y squared, squared, e y. There's a minus sign here, you just can't see it. So when I square a square root, the square root goes away. So this is the integral from 0 to 2 of 4, because 2 squared is 4, times 4 minus y squared. And so that is 4y minus one third y cubed. The value is from zero to two. So this is Oh, I don't know, 32 minus 
minus four thirds of eight. Something wrong here. Well, 32 minus 32 over three, which is uh, 64. Because it's a square. If it was a triangle, then I would multiply the base times the height and divide by two. If it was a circle, I would do pi r squared. If it was Mickey Mouse, I would have to work a lot harder. Yeah? Well, I would have to tell you what shape of triangle. Is it an equilateral triangle? Is it a really tall triangle? I would have to tell you some relationship between the height and the base. Because all we know is the base. So, for example, I could say it was an equilateral triangle. So if it's an equilateral triangle, of course I don't know where to write. So if it was an equilateral triangle, for example, if I know the base here, and this is also the base, then I would have to use the fact that this is 60 degrees, so this is a 1, 2 square root 3, I mean, one, you know, 30, 60, 90 triangle. And so this would be uh, B over 2. So this would be P over square root 3. And so then what I would integrate is B squared divided by root 3. Like 2 root 3. 2 root 3. Oh, no. Yeah, 2 root 3. Right? Because B over 2 squared... So I would integrate b squared over 2 root 3. 2 over 3. It's not coming out by now. Okay. But you understand it. And if it was a semicircle, well then it would be something else. It would be pi r squared over 2. So all of these problems are all the same once you figure out what the slice is. The hard thing is to remember that you have to integrate this part. Okay, other questions? If you have no questions, then we're done. Are we done? Oh, uh, we have a question now. Yeah? Yeah? Well, okay, so I don't have a predator prey formula in my brain, so let's just make a picture. Okay? So. What, well, okay, so there's many variations on these predator prey problems that could be asked, just like there were many variations on the homework. One thing could be, here's an equation, tell me what happens. Another thing could be, here's an equation, does this describe a predator or a cooperative or whatever. Another one could be, here's a phase portrait, tell me what the graphs look like. Or here's some graphs, tell me what the phase portrait looks like. Have a, I mean, or a, a problem that's been way too long is here's an equation, tell me everything. So do you have a preference? Okay, let me make one up. So here's a graph. Um, so this is prime, and this is the predator. Uh, so the predator is, I don't know, leopards. And the population, the leopard population over time, well, initially they start here, they say 10, and they grow, and then they fade, and then they grow, and they fade like this. And this is, uh, I don't know, 15. And here is the graph of who do leopards hunt? Gazelles. Okay. Here's the population of gazelles. And at a given time, the gazelles, there's a hundred gazelles at the start, and they're doing just fine, and they start to fade off. And then they grow, and I need to make these match up somehow uh, here. Well, okay. The gazelles do something like this too, and, and the bumps match up in a nice way. 
So what does this look like in the phase portrait? So I want to draw in a given map. I want to draw a graph in the leopard versus gazelle land. So when we start here, we have 10 leopards and 100 gazelles. So we have 10 here and 100 here. And as time goes on, the leopard population increases up to about 20. So the leopard population will grow up to about 20. And the gazelle population grows a little bit, and then it starts to fall off. So if we start here at 10, 100, both populations grow a little bit, and then the gazelles start to die off. So that means that the leopards continue to grow, but the gazelle population drops. Until the leopard population reaches some maximum of about 20, and the gazelles are continuing to drop off. And so they drop off to down to like 50. So the leopards reach their maximum of about 20, and the gazelles drop off. So now, which is here, here. And then the leopards start to, uh, then they both start to fail, and they go down. Oops, not as much. And I get something like that. The leopards grow. The leopards grow. Then the gazelles fall off. Then the leopards start to fall off. And the gazelles start to come back. And you get this oscillation. It looks something like that. Yeah? So this will become a spiral that limits on some equilibrium. Because if you look at these two graphs, eventually they start to stop wobbling and they're always some number. If, on the other hand, so let's turn it around. Suppose that instead of this picture, we saw this. So now I'm going to give you the picture and go the other way. So if I give you a picture like this, then this is saying, if I look at the gazelle population starting, I don't know, here, they grow to some maximum, and then they decrease back to the original amount. So if I make the, the picture of gazelles versus time, this is, I don't know, 100, and this is 200. They go from 100 to 200, so they grow, and then they fail, and then they grow and then they fail, and they oscillate like a sine curve. And the same thing happens to the leopards, but with two different patterns. And they're shifted by a quarter period. But again, the leopards is also going to look like a sine curve, but shifted by a quarter period. Because starting here, the leopards shrink a little, then they come back a lot, and then they shrink that same amount and come back that same amount. Yeah? I think of a question. So I could ask you, I could give you two graphs like this. I could either ask you to draw this graph. I could give you several graphs and say pick. Uh, I could ask you to answer a question like, what do you expect to happen to the leopard and gazelle population after 100 years? Something like that. Or I could give you a picture like this and say, what will happen after a long time to the population? Or, I mean, those kinds of things. Probably I won't ask you to draw the pictures because this health is great. So more likely I will give you a bunch of possible pictures and ask you to choose one or choose one and interpret it or something like that. No, that probably be part two. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, has there ever been a case where in a base graph Just that these guys would these guys would shrink as these guys grow. And you know, sure, I can make them do whatever you want. I can't make them cross, but I can make them 
you know, write my name on it. So we went, well, I don't usually cross the T's. So we just switch to X. So. Can do all sorts of things. Yeah. Um, the big thing that we've done this time, that the second to last one thing to do over here, we had a bunch of people over here. Mm -hmm. And we did it with some of them. I don't know if you're with me. So that's another kind of question. So uh, you asked it, right? No, I forget. I don't, I don't remember who asked it, right? Which like question was it really? It doesn't matter. So if I have some equation, so let's say I have r prime is 3r minus, uh, I mean, so the numbers, I don't know, the numbers are going to be, yeah. Okay. It was a logistic plus an interaction term, right? So this was something like 3R. This is the prey. So let's make this be the predator. Let's just make it easy. Minus R plus 2RW. And the prey W prime is, uh, oh, except R's, oh well. So the prey is now weird, and the predator, it doesn't. W times 1 minus, it's just, yeah, 1 minus W over 10 uh, minus, R W. So here, I mean, w, actually, the prey is now the predator. Of, so the the prey are wombats, and the R's are rabid dingoes. Whatever. R is the predator here. Well, yes, R is the predator here, and W is the prey because the interaction here is favorable for the R's and unfavorable for the for the W's. So predator and prey are swapped here. But, so they're rapid dingoes and wombats. So now we want to find the equilibrium. Well, the thing to notice is that, let's say in this one, there's an R in each term, so we probably want to factor. So I get R prime is R times minus 1 plus 2W. So this will be 0 exactly when R is 0 or W is a half. Zero, and I'm looking for equilibria, which means both of them are zero. So I also have to figure out when w is zero. So I, and I notice that there's a w term. Well, I can factor this. Let's just plug in. Then it's easier. So if r is zero, then I have this. So if R is zero, then W prime is W times one minus W over ten. So this is zero. If W is zero or W is ten. So that means that I get equilibria at I get one here and one here at 10. Right? And then the other case, my chalk just died, so I don't think you need the fast chalk anymore. So I'll have to try and press harder. So that's one case of R is zero. The other case is when W is a half. That will also make R prime zero. So if Then I have W prime is a half times uh, 
1 minus a half over 10 minus 1 half r. And I want to know when is that 0? So that's 0. I want that to be 0. So that means a half r equals that. So r is 1 minus 1 over 20. is a strange number, but uh, it's a 19, 1920s. So this must be, you know, in hundreds of things, or millions of things, it's 1920s, uh, uh, whatever it is, the rapid bingo is not fair. So I get one here that I have 1920s. So here, okay, what was this number? Ten. Zero is, this is 10. So it's way back here. My scale is all screwy. So I get a half 19. Everything happens. So anyway, there's three of them. Let's see. If, if R, if W is large, yes, if W is large, if W is larger than a half, then notice that this is positive for, for R. So this goes up on this side. So the R's go up over here and come down over here. And the W's go up over here and down over here. So that means that we're going to get something like this and we'll get Okay. And I guess things. Okay. You give him a minute. Right now, did he leave? Did you have friends in the next few minutes? Um. Did you put someone else with you? Yeah, but he's gone, so I got confused. Okay. Other questions? 
questions? Yeah. Do you have foreign affairs questions? Do you have foreign affairs questions? Okay. Uh, you have one in mind? Yeah. Most of the are some questions. So, do you want area? Or what do you want? Area. So, let's say, I mean, just so this one is extremely long. So when I do that integral, I get one quarter. 
and the integral of 1 is theta. And the integral of cosine, negative cosine 8 theta is negative sine 8 theta over 8. So this half is just, so, so there's two halves, and they come from two different places. This one comes from the fact that the area of the circle is pi r squared, and I want some little fraction of this. I want one, one theta, or one d theta, one d theta of this circle. Right. So all the way around here is 2 pi. And I don't want the whole thing. I just want a little z theta of it. So that's where the 2 comes from here. Right? So I have pi r squared, and I want z theta equals 2 pi. And so the pi is canceled, leaving me an r squared over here. They don't want the whole thing, you know, they want. So, so this half is the two inch pi, and this half is the one half in that. So it's a quarter of theta minus the sine of eight theta over eight, evaluated from zero pi over four. So this is pi over 16 minus Zero plus zero. This is pi over six. Now, of course, we can make the problem more complicated. There could be two guys that you gotta figure out where they cross or stuff. Who's left? I forgot. There you are. Right? I could have another curve here. Find the area outside, then I have to find out where the two curves cross, and then I integrate from where one goes to the other goes, and then I would take the area of the outside minus the area of the inside. I mean, there's lots of variation you can put on this. But essentially, polar area, once you set it up, is not too bad. But you have to remember that it's one half r squared, or figure out that it's one half r squared, and you have to be able to figure out where things cross if there's more than one curve. Well, even if there's not more than one curve involved, you have to figure out where the regions you're talking about are. Yeah? Well, so the definition of a sequence being bounded means it never gets bigger than some number. So if the limit, if it has a limit and the limit is less than something, then it's bounded. If it doesn't have a limit, but it never gets bigger than something new. The idea is you want to find some number that is always less than. And if that number exists, then it's bounded. Usually this will be something where the power on the bottom is bigger than the power on the top, or equal to the power on the top, or you have a sine or a cosine laying around, or e to the minus x, or something. I can't just say, here is the method, do it. Because the method is going to vary by the function. The method is find the bound. And if there is no bound, then it is a bound. But it's not a very satisfactory answer. Um, if, if you... So, this is essentially geometric series in disguise. Uh, so, let's say I have, I don't know, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3. So, what does this mean? This means this is the sum. So if I notice, it repeats every two. So it's 23 over 100, 23 
over 1,000 plus 23 over, well, let me write it this way. 23 over 1,000 in more zeros, 23 over 1,000 in more zeros, etc. Huh? Because this is 23 thousandths. Yes, what am I saying? Thank you. Anyway, 100 squared. So this is 23 over 100 squared, 23 over 100 cubed, etc. So this is the geometric series, 23 over 100 times the sum from n equals 0 to infinity, 1 and 1. 1 over 100 to the n. Right? OK, well, you know this sum. This is a geometric series. So this sum is 1 minus 1 over, let me just write it up here. So this is 23 over 100 times 1 minus 1 over 1 minus 1 over 100, because it's a geometric series. So this is 23 over 100 times 100 over 99, which is 23 over 99. So it's just really the geometric series in disguise. And the disguise isn't very cool. It's like, you know, fake pair of glasses. It's as bad as the Mark Kent's disguise. Other questions? Do we have room for 10 more minutes? And then, no, 4.45. Do we have the room for 40 more minutes? Damn. Can we have the room for 10 more minutes and that's it? Okay, so if you have no more questions, then I don't have to ask them.
I mean, it's bizarre, but this weight is, is actually a force and not a mass. So 40 pounds, so we don't have any. Okay? So that means, so our work is the integral of the force times the distance it's applied. this up. I'm missing an H. So it has to travel a distance of H. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. It has to travel a distance of H. So there we go. And it's better. Do you want me to do it? So the question is whether we're talking about a force or a mass. If you have a mass, which is in kilograms, so this is a physics fact. If you have a mass, then determine that the mass, the force that is involved, is the force times the acceleration due to gravity. I mean, force equals mass times acceleration. So if the units are in kilograms, then that means kilograms are not a unit of force, they're a unit of mass. So we have to multiply kilograms times the acceleration due to gravity to turn this into a force. Kilograms per second squared. Or kilogram meters per second squared. But weight, pounds, is a force. So here's how you know that you don't need G. The work is in units called foot pounds. Well, if I integrate pounds times feet, guess what I get? Foot pounds. So I don't need anything to adjust the units. A newton is in kilogram meters per second squared. So that means I need to multiply by meters per second squared to convert kilograms into kilogram meters per second squared. So joules is kilogram meters per second squared. Any work problem on the test will not need a G. Because this is not a physics class. So I hate these problems. On the other hand, Professor Wong loves these problems. 
So we have to find a way to make time. Yeah.
But since it's a different problem, it has a different set. But if you yell loudly enough, you'll probably make me change it and then I'll get it wrong. Other questions? Yeah. Come in the back of the hat. to the end. Okay? But we want to know for what x does this converge? Okay? So, to figure out for what x does this converge, we just say x is some number and we look at the ratio test. And we take the limit as n goes to infinity of uh, the next term over the current term. We want that to be less than 1 to make it converge. So this is the limit as n goes to infinity of the next term. So that's n plus 1 over e to the n plus 1 x minus 3 x minus 3 n plus 1, divided by n over e to the n, x minus 3 to the n. That's the limit I need to do. And so, stuff cancels. This doesn't cancel.
if x equals 3 minus e. When x is 3 minus e, I have 3 minus e minus 3, so that's minus e to the n. My series becomes the sum of n minus 1 to the n. Because 3 minus e to the n is, mi is minus e to the n, and over e to the n can be a minus 1 to the n. So again, this type of things. So in fact, it doesn't converge at either end. So my interval of convergence is x between 3 minus e and 3 plus e, not including either end.